Democrats, and I remind you, Democrats have a lot more power in the Senate now than they used to. But the Senate Democrats have, in fact, reintroduced the D.C. statehood bill. This, my friends, is a reason to celebrate in and of itself. D.C. statehood is a long-running and uh, contentious issue um, out there in the world right now. This place is full of ads. This is the hill. Are you all broke over at the hill? Jesus Christ, why are you selling so much ad space? Oh, God, print media is dying the long, slow death. So, first discussion subject. Let's talk about D.C. statehood, what I mean when I'm talking about that, and the significance of it. A group of Senate Democrats led by Tom Carper, Democrat from Delaware, reintroduced legislation to give Washington, D.C. statehood on Wednesday. This is the first major effort to push towards statehood since the Capitol riot earlier this month. And the Capitol riot sends echoes of the importance of D.C. statehood. So for those who don't know, uh, or maybe my non-American viewers, Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States of America. It is the seat of the capital in Washington, D.C., in addition to several national monuments, as well as a number of historic museums and locations, is the home of the White House, which is the house, the mansion, the presidential mansion. That's the head of the executive branch. He lives there. Okay, that's now where good old corn pop Joe Biden lives. In addition to that, it's also where the Capitol is, the place where that insurrection took place on the 6th of this month. That is where our legislature meets in session to draft the, uh, the bills that become law. Right? The representatives that are elected meet in Washington, D.C. In addition to that, the Pentagon is in D.C., the Pentagon is basically the headquarters for the Department of Defense and the main headquarters for all of the United States Armed Forces. Basically, the primary leadership of the United States Armed Forces are based through the Pentagon. So that's already three major elements of our country based in Washington, D.C., our capital. Not to, Oh, and I forgot about the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is in D.C. as well. So, right now, Washington, D.C. is kind of a funny uh, geographic distinction. Basically, as it stands right now, Washington, D.C. is more or less just an odd carved out district that sort of sits at the intersection of a number of states. I have it pulled up here right now. It stands for District of Columbia. District of Columbia, uh, which I'm not going to get into the historical reasons why it's named District of Columbia. But if you look here, when I zoom in on Google Maps, the District of Columbia, which I remind you is currently not a state, has no statehood, is bordered with Maryland. Okay. So over here is Maryland, right? Then it's basically surrounded by Maryland and a couple other states. A number it's basically part of a megalopolis if you will. There's a few states with a lot of conti almost contiguous cities that are all but end to Washington DC. The reason this is so important is the people who live here have placed such they're, they're so interconnected with the goings-on of our entire nation. Which is why it's really, really terrible that Washington, D.C. has not been a state in and of itself. Washington, D.C. has a representative in the House of Representatives who currently is not allowed to vote. It's essentially an honorary position. Now... She's actually a pretty great representative and very fiery and has been ringing the bell for D.C. statehood for a long time. So we're talking about Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes. She's, uh, she's pretty awesome, too. She has been fighting for the people 
of Washington, D.C. for all of her political career. And one of her biggest fights was statehood. Yeah. Washington, D.C. has more has a bigger population than Vermont or Rhode Island. And their population is on par with that of Alaska, the largest state in our union. Seriously, Alaska has like no people in it. <laughs> so like if we look here, it's Washington, D.C. has a population of 692,000. I misspoke on the Rhode Island bit. Rhode Island's a bit more densely populated. Washington, D.C. has a population of 692,000 as of 2019. So that's before the last um, census. So it's most definitely higher. Uh, that's more than Wyoming. And Wyoming's fucking enormous. Here, we, we have to talk about the elephant in the room when we talk about Washington, D.C., right? There is an elephant in the room that is often ignored. And that is DC is a fairly, uh, well, we're just going to call it what it is. DC is a disproportionately black district, right? So I showed you that it has a population larger than a few states. Then you take into account that you look at the population of Washington, DC. 47.1%, according to 2017 census data, 47.1% black. Washington, D.C. is one of the most populous black districts in the country. If it was made a state, it would be almost near the top of the most populated uh, of the highest percentage of black residents in any given state that's a huge deal more importantly as we mentioned earlier that is a massive massive amount of a black population without representation in congress we can see that this is a failure for everyone to have their opportunity to participate in the representative democracy. They have no representative and it is a massive black population. One of the most one of the highest black populations of any district or specific region in the country. And having it, revolution is now is very correct. Having it as an independent state puts more power into the hands of the congressional seat for that black population. If it got rolled into Virginia or Maryland, and Maryland does have cities that are heavily populated by black residents, but they would get diluted into the white voting populace of either Maryland or Virginia. See, and they're smart. They understand, and that goes back to what I said, you know, they understand that that would be a cultural and a best interest conflict if they were to get rolled into another state. They would basically be seeding what's in their best interest as a largely black, lower income population. It's, it's a metropolitan area outside of the, the Capitol Mall and the campus. And this is a big opportunity to put some voting power back in the hands of black residents. So where does that take us? I mentioned earlier that DC has a Congresswoman. A lot of people don't know that DC has a Congresswoman. Her name is Eleanor Holmes Norton. Eleanor, Nor Eleanor Norton is an elected official, and that's the biggest failure right there. She is an elected official. People are overwhelmingly happy and supportive of her as their elected official, and yet she does not get to vote. Every single thing you think about that affects what we're trying to get through Congress, Medicare for all, tuition-free college, student loan forgiveness, think about a whole population of black residents which that's a group of people who don't have a voice on these issues that's what we learned last year or in this past election season talking about the v votes in georgia and we learned that georgia is not a red state georgia is a voter suppressed state the same the same is true for washington dc yes washington dc has a higher population than vermont and wyoming about 282,000. 282,000 people Don't 282,000 minorities don't have a say in Congress. 
that's got to end. This is something that's been pushed for a long time, especially since the population of uh, black residents has increased in D.C. So the name of the bill is H.R. 51 that was introduced in a Democratic controlled Senate. Woo! This is actually a fight that could be won. This, this is a fight that could be won. And as I said before, El <laughs> Eleanor Norton is just awesome. Right. DC is extremely politically engaged. Virtualak is correct. DC, because of their seat at the capital of the country, they are oftentimes at the forefront of a lot of these social changes, believe it or not. And, and there's a lot of stuff that plays into what's going on. The fact that D.C. is ran by a federal committee. Do you want to know what that federal committee runs? Try the Capitol Police. The fact that you have major federal law enforcement agencies and clandestine agencies like the CIA and the NSA and the FBI working there in their city. These are things that if people had some representation, they could have a voice against this sort of police state that's sitting in their backyard. This Voting Rights Act has been getting fought for years. They've tried to put through Voting Rights Acts so that the representative for the District of Columbia could actually vote on House issues. And honestly, they, they've been shouted down a lot. That's just the honest truth. It's, it's not it's not good. And again, we talk about the difference between de facto and de jure. This isn't de jure, but this is some serious de facto uh, disenfranchisement of a major chunk of black population on the eastern seaboard. It is almost, it is almost laser focused on disenfranchising a number of black voters. And, and, and that's pretty terrible, I mean, if you ask me. What can we do to push this? You know, you can call your congressperson. That does work. Google the congressional switchboard. Call your senator and tell them to vote, regardless of their colors. Call your senator and tell them to vote in the affirmative for H.R. 91, or H.R. 51, excuse me. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I thank the gentleman for his strong advocacy for the for rights of all Americans. Um, I must begin by saying when you hear people come to the floor and invoke the word fairness in a debate where they oppose the basic right to vote, they drain that word of all of its meaning. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to speak to the rule proper. I'd like to offer some thanks during this rule period. And I would like to say a word about Utah, uh, our very strong partner about whom we hear little because they are so far away. The other side, after uh, the last put on this bill, clucked that they had actually stopped the people in the nation's capital from getting a vote. Imagine how that was received all around the world. Now they come it to the not floor. It has me that this is on Nancy with the Pelosi's nerve YouTube channel. To object to the procedure. Mind you, the substance is is really what they are after. If in fact the District of Columbia was a largely Republican city, these members would be on the floor arguing for voting rights for the District of Columbia, uh, just as the radical Republican abolitionists gave us the vote, which was then taken from us and well, gave us yield. home rule. Yield. I will not yield, sir. Will not the yield. District of Columbia has spent 206 years yielding to people who would deny them the vote. I yield you no ground. Not during my I'm time. You, you have yeah. had your say, and your say has been that you think that the people who live in your capital are not entitled to a vote in their house. Shame on you. Yeah, as I said, absolute queen.
a, a majority black district that has not had congressional representation. And the Republicans have blocked it. Conservatives have been blocking it for years and years and years. It is basically at this point targeted disenfranchisement, and there's no reason why we don't put an end to it. Call your Congress people. So that covers the D.C. statehood. Uh, like I said, if you're going to call your congressperson, you want to tell them to fight for D.C. statehood. If they want your vote, they will support H.R. 51 the fight for D.C. statehood. There's a lot of issues on H.R. 51 that would help the people of Washington, D.C. And it goes over a little bit of history here. They, they've had their vote ignored. In 2016, 85% of D.C. Re residents blowing any vote participation of any election in the United States out of the water, 85% voted in favor of becoming the 51st state. This month of this year, with a new Democratic House majority and a new Democratic Senate, they don't have a mayor. Washington, D.C. doesn't have a mayor. Normally, a mayor is the one who, or a mayor or a city council is the one, for instance, who communicates with the local police department. A city council is the one that drafts city budgets. All of this, all of this is handled by a federal committee. The people of D.C. deserve the same rights that every other state in this country has. If it is, in fact, a democratic republic, we are treating a sizable chunk of land undemocratically. The majority of present-day District of Columbia, with, with an exception of basically the areas of federal government buildings and legislature, would still be designated as the nation's capital. So there would be a remaining territory. That's the thing. There would be a federal-owned territory still designated as the nation's capital, but we would still be able to grant statehood. We can literally have our cake and eat it too. D.C. Autonomous Zone. Fucking Occupy. D.C. Autonomous Zone. Decause? Would it be an occupied protest? Decop? Oh, no. Nope. No, not Decop. This has a record number of House co-sponsors. 223. That's more than... Oh, goodness. That's massive. The Senate's D.C. statehood bill has the most co-sponsors ever at 34 out of 99 co-sponsors, if you don't count the one who introduced it. And the House passed H.R. 1 for the People Act, which was basically the act to make a committee, and it had extensive findings in support of D.C. statehood. Nancy Pelosi supports D.C. statehood. House Majority Leader, now the Democratic House Majority Leader, Staney Hoyer, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, also supports it. Even all these cringe-ass libs are supporting this. 100 national advocacy groups. This passed last year. History is in the making. We are undoing t almost 220 years of disenfranchisement of one of the most populous black districts in this country. So, something to think about. That is something that got me very excited today. And that wasn't even the first bit of news that I heard.